So uh, what the plan today is, is to um, talk about the church and uh, what uh, the history of the church really. Um, <clears throat> it's been a, a turbulent time for for the church as we know throughout all history. Is, you know, if you've had that chance to uh, experience, um, you know, just a some of the history of uh, the persecutions and just the rise and fall of Christianity, how it all went, and uh, but it was really important when 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 they asked Jesus, um, well, when Jesus said to Peter, he said, "Well, who who am I? You know, what's all this about? Who who am I?" And Peter he he got a lot of things wrong till he got to the Holy Ghost, but then he got this one right. He said, "You're the Christ." You're the son of the living God. And and Jesus said, that's correct. He said, he said, absolutely true. And he said, and upon this this this, this that statement that he is 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 the Christ, upon that rock, I'll build my church, and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. And so it, the essence of, of who Jesus was would be the Christ, the anointer. And he would then build a church out of that. And what we've got to understand is that that's the church that we belong to. That's where we've been placed in. So I've got some uh, slides today on the church's history and uh, particularly our history. Try and turn that this thing on. We'll go from there. And I hope you enjoy it. So, um, are we streaming to the YouTube? Is that happening, um, Andrea? So if you might want to pick up on some of this later, or if you can, or Jacob, to make sure that we uh, are going to YouTube with some of these thoughts today. This sort of hasn't come up on my screen, but that's the case. Anyway, welcome. If you're um, online today or you're, you're viewing, viewing us through the YouTube, nice to have you with us, or you're in the hall today, in the meeting hall, Got some little thoughts about the history of the church, the Christian church. Uh, roll through this. Okay, a couple of thoughts here. Quite a bit of information today, so I hope you're um, you're in a comfortable position and uh, ready to go. Matthew seven. Jesus said to enter into the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in there at. Now, one thing about the, the Bible and the Word of God is that unlike mankind, it's not, it doesn't understate, doesn't overstate, there's no exaggerations in it, and there's no contradictions in the Bible, despite there's bad interpretations, there's bad explanations, there's false prophets and teachers, the world is full of it, but the Bible is a very sound book. Despite all the that you might hear from everybody that says, oh, you know, it's just all these stories and they're just being badly explained and, and, and misinterpreted. And so when he says that there's this massive way that the majority of people that are going to head down, well, that's what would happen. And he said in, in 14, because straight is the gate, narrow is the way, because it is highly restricted and it is extremely narrow, um, that leads to life, there'd be a few people that would find it. So there's one of the facts to start with, is that it's going to be only for a few people. And we're very fortunate. We're blessed. We don't know why. I don't know why Jesus picked us, me. You know, we all look around us and we say, you know, a lot of better people out there that could have fallen into that category. Um, all right, so, okay, we'll just get a couple of messages from Julie here. Yeah, we lost the internet, okay, all right, okay, it looks like we're not going to, so this is a one and only, so here we go, so I can, uh, so what I like there, mate, we'll uh, make it up as we go, no, all right, here we go, the words of Jesus. So when we go to the, the words of Jesus, we find here that he said, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry or wait in Jerusalem until you be endured. 
with power from on high. That's in Luke 24, verse 49. He says, wait, wait, not yet. <laughs> Don't go out starting a church or, or get anything going. Wait till you get the power of the Holy Ghost, all right? And then in Mark 16, and uh, these are foundation scriptures for our fellowship, Jesus said, well, actually, you're going to be identifying believers. The sign of believers would be, one of them would be, that they'd speak in, in these new tongues. Now, it's a new language. It's, a, it's an unlearned language, unacquired. It, 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 it's a, a very unique uh, episode or event that takes the people who believe, who believe in Jesus. So that promise was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. All right. <clears throat> Here we have the, the day of Pentecost. And uh, this is when you read your book of the Bible. You've got the New Testament, you've got Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Then it goes to the book of Acts. And in the Acts there, it starts. And this is the beginning of the church. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance or the ability to do that. So here we find that um, that the Holy Ghost has been promised back there and now it's been delivered. And this is when the church began. Now it didn't begin at the cross when Jesus died at the crucifixion. It didn't begin when Jesus started his ministry, you know, and started healing people. It didn't begin when he, he, he rose from the dead. Um, and uh, it didn't even begin when he ascended into heaven. You think, well, that'd be the, the green light. Start the church. Let's these things get. Didn't happen. He said, wait, wait, wait till you get the power of the Holy Ghost. That's when the church began. And that's when Paul got up and uh, Peter got up, sorry, and told them this is what happened. We started, they all started speaking in these languages, which was the sign that they'd been filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, that's the Bible story. And like I said, and few people know that. It's amazing that that is the common experience. It, it, is, it doesn't contradict itself. It's very clear there in scriptures. And yet, and that was the beginning of the church. Okay. So <clears throat> when uh, you look at uh, the scientific uh, evidence of what tongues is, when they, and they've done this, you know, they hook you up with all this, the, the wires to see what is going on in neuroscience to see what happens when a person speaks in tongues, right? Now, these are some of the um, recordings. Uh, the word glossolalia is, is this ability to, to speak in tongues. And um, while it, it, it is a language that's not, that you don't learn, it's not a language that you learn. This is what is so remarkable about it. <clears throat> and so, they found that when people were speaking in tongues and they're hooked up to the wire, they found the activity in the language centers of the brain, it decreased, right? So all the stuff that we need to process, like I am now of trying to bring a talk together and look at my notes and speak to you and, and all that activity, when a person speaks in tongues, it stops. We don't have to think about what word we're going to say next. But what does get heightened is the activity in the emotional centers of the brain that increases. Now, if we just pause on that for a little moment, this is why Paul, the scriptures, and we as a church encourage people, you know, to speak in tongues, to, to use the Holy Ghost to pray, you know, because it has um, these incredible um, benefits for your for your mind. Your emotional centers is where your love and your joy and your peace, just that the rationale, the, that, that, that the emotional side of life is dealt with. And so as you're praying in tongues, it is this wonderful outlet for us to access the things that we need to sustain a balanced and a healthy life. And there's not something that we've just, because we're really smart people, you can pray in tongues and this area of our brain is wonderfully blessed. The activity of the areas of control decrease. 
and say, you know, this is where we, we've got to control the circumstances. We've got to fix the problem. You know, you might be a real go-to-it person and oh, I'll get this done and I'll get that done. And as soon as I got this, well, well, when you have a nice time of prayer in the spirit, that stops as well, <laughs> which is good. This is why it's nice, you know. Uh, we encourage people, even before we come to hear the word of God, to spend a bit of time praying, listen to some lovely music, to pray in the spirit when we've got needs, when we've got pressures, when we've got everything, go to the Lord in prayer, pray to him and the great benefits of it. And Jesus knew that. It wasn't just to say, oh, this is, a, as we've heard testify, another party trick. <clears throat> this is actually what God intended for us to have. Glossolalia is not associated with usual language, language functions. So this is something totally different. Paul the Apostle said, he that speaks in an unknown tongue, in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 2, he that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not unto men but unto God. I don't know how many Jehovah's Witnesses that I've showed this scripture to, and they just seem to ignore it. <laughs> I'm saying, mate, it's not to communicate and go and convert other nations, as people will tell you, speaking in tongues. That's why they spoke in tongues. It is to pray to God. He that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not unto men but unto God. We don't talk to each other in tongues, we talk to God. If I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prays. Your spirit prays when you pray in tongues. And what does God tell us? Jesus said, he said, the hour comes and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Now that's what God wants. Now this is, this is that restricted, narrow way you know, you've got to be born again, the end of the kingdom of God, the things that we preach week in, week out. And I am amazed how few churches in our world have it. You go to their websites, you talk to people, you say, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? Do you believe in speaking in tongues? And it's just a mishmash. We're very clear. We're very definite about it, but there's only few of it. So today we're looking at church history and we're going to find that that there was, wasn't a great deal of people, you know, <laughs> the, the, the churches that had this. Paul remind us, and I love this scripture too, uh, I think you can't go past Romans 8 for a wonderful edification of what the Holy Ghost is. It is one of our go-to chapters. We're told in Romans 8, verse 26, likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities. That's our weaknesses, our shortcomings, because we don't even know what we should pray as we ought but the spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. It can't be expressed. Look, we all know it, can't we? We can all give testimony of how the fact that, look, there's all this stuff is going on. I was really anxious. And then, oh, come on. I needed to have a good time of prayer. I really needed to just hand it over to the Lord, pray it out, get that emotional part of our life right so that we can deal with it. And that's the way we get through our situations. He that searches the heart knows what is the mind of the spirit because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. You understand that. I understand that. But I don't know what the other people think that means. How does it search our heart? How does it, what is it? That's what the Holy Ghost does. That's the miracle of speaking in tongues and the edification of it. So Paul warned, he said straight up, he said, be careful, take really care of yourselves and unto the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. And that's what we take as a responsibility as a pastor and an oversight. Make sure you're getting fed good stuff, stuff that's going to be for your edification that can get you into that good place with God. Because know this, that after my departing, after Paul dies, shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Now, uh, again, this isn't an understatement. It's not an exaggeration. It's not scare tactics. Paul said, once I'm out of the picture, guys, the place is going to fall apart. The message is. He had a, a clear revelation of what the future held for the church and the moving away from it. And he says, and as a matter of fact, even of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw disciples, to draw away disciples after them. And we've even seen that in our own church. We've had a history of people. They all come in loving it, embracing it, believing it, preaching it. And then after a while, oh, no, 
we want to go and do our own thing now or, you know, we've got a better way, which, you know, yes, well, I haven't seen a better way yet. All right. Uh, Peter also did the same sort of remindings. He said there were false prophets among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. And he's talking about the church that who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord uh, that bought them. So damnable her heresy is, is a self-opinionated. It's a self, it's their opinions there. But they're, they're damnable is that they, they just take you down, the, <laughs> they take you on that broad way and they shall bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many, not, not a few, but many shall follow their panacious and, and the panacious, it's an old word, but it's, I think it's got to do with the sort of, um, it, 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 it's, a, it's a deceitful way. And by reason of, 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 uh, of whom the way of truth shall be even evil spoken of. So all of a sudden the church that often saves people, that brings them in, becomes this sort of like bad place full of, you know, brainwashers or nasty people or something like that. It's really sad, but that's what the Bible said. So you can expect that to happen. All right, so history, history lesson, here we go. So 100, 103, this guy, Justin Marner, he was, that was his age in that 103 to 165. So we were, we were 150 years in to, since this day of Pentecost, and, um, or even less. So it's not a long time. If, if you look back and, and say, if you think of our current Pentecostal movement, which we're part of, dates back to, you know, late 1890s, maybe 1900. So we're 120 years in. By the time they got to 100 years on in the church, this was something that he wrote about Christian conversion. He said, oh, well, I'll do a little thesis of it. And he described repentance, saw that, and baptism, but he didn't even mention the Holy Spirit. Like the whole purpose of getting baptised and repenting is to receive the Holy Spirit uh, with all the signs that follow it. So straight away, 100 years down the track, it's gone. He said that repentance and knowledge brought illumination without the Holy Spirit. And apologies like a thesis is like a, a statement they give. And um, so... Uh, Again, here's a, a change in the doctrine and the teaching. John Christendom, he, uh, 300 years down the track, he had this homily on, on 1 Corinthians. And he said, very interesting, the spiritual gifts, speaking tongues, he, he said, but it's really obscure. And he said, but the obscurity is produced by our ignorance of the facts referred to and by their cessation. So in other words, it wasn't happening. No speaking in tongues, no two or three of the gifts, the Holy Ghost. Why they did happen and how they do so no more. So again, um, he just posed the question. Oh, Augustine the Hippo. No, old Hippo. There he was. Another 300 years. The sign of speaking in tongues was done for a token and it passed away. So he drew the conclusion. He probably had that sort of view. Oh, yeah, well, that was a sign for that day, but, you know, it's all finished now. And he said, neither of the sick healed by the shadow of preachers of Christ falling on them as they passed and other such things that were done. But they are manifestly ceased. So he said, no, he said, that was all for back then, not for now. And uh, and these, these a lot of these things are, are from uh, recognised um, uh, writings that uh, are around in circulation. It's not just, uh, you know... The, a lot of the Catholic encyclopedias there that have got the history books that have gone back and got all the records there. So on the other side of the coin is that there are recorded history of the groups that did speak in tongues and that were part very much of it. And But again, they're, they're the minority and they're few. As we know, uh, you know, when Constantine came to power in the Roman Empire and... Uh, Made, made, made a decree that, you know, that we're all Christians now and they then uh, adopted all the pagan worship and just uh, mixed them all in with, uh, you know, Queen of Harry, Heaven worship, uh, worship uh, doing with Mary and just the whole, um, you, know, uh, the, you know, saints and putting all the, the, the names of these people and the roles and, uh, you know, all from, from really pagan uh, Rome. 
and um, people just accepted that. So the Broadway is where the whole of Christianity headed down. So we had the Montanans, and they were our followers of this uh, Montanus. And, and uh, we read here that um, one explanation there on the history of the church, they began in an ecstasy. They began to babble in jargon and other strange things. The Mont Montanists imagined themselves possessed of the Holy Spirit and of a prophetic gift. Well, you know, we understand what that is. So no doubt they were getting filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues. As it says, this reminds us of speaking in tongues, which the ecstasies of the Montanists have been often compared. And that's from the Catholic Encyclopedia. Okay. Uh, Irenaeus, Bishop of Lyons. Uh, it was funny uh, when uh, Jeanette and I went to to uh, see meet uh, Sebastian's family, and that we also had a, a, a wedding marriage service over there in France as well. They live near Lyon, and uh, we uh, went and uh, met a few of them. And, and Sebastian's grandfather, they lived up in this really lovely village. Uh, you know, one of those ideal French location. No one speaks any English. And, and um, anyway, they were trying to work out what a pastor was being me because, you know, maybe it's mainly Catholic France and all that. But they did know Protestant. And uh, that was the closest thing they could relate to, that I was a Protestant uh, minister as being a pastor. And uh, and, then, <clears throat> and then I read in, in the local church in this local village that were in this highland, I sort of just wandered in, had a little bit of a look around, and uh, there was a, they hid a lot of the Protestants there during all the um, persecution there, and they had a particular a sort of um, a sort of a memorial plaque to them. So again, um, <clears throat> France uh, I, I had a bit to play in those early uh, days of um, uh, revivals. Iranus, Bishop of Lyons, he said, we do also hear many brethren in the church who possess prophetic gifts, who through the spirit speak all kinds of languages. Uh, Tertullian of Carthage. Now all these signs of spiritual gifts are forthcoming from my side without any difficult. Here then is my frank avail for anyone who cares to require it. So again, he's also very much aware of what's going on. Uh, what else have we got here? Ambrose Bishop of Milan, he also, uh, the Father gives the gifts of healing, so does the Son give. As the Father gives the gift of tongues, so too has the Son also granted it. And that's on the Holy Spirit book too. All these books are old books that are written on the church. And then uh, we're all obviously probably aware of Patrick of Ireland. He uh, recorded that the Holy Spirit um, <clears throat> And that the Holy Spirit prayed from within him in words which he couldn't understand. Well, we got a fair idea what that's about. The Holy Ghost, be the venerable there, suggested evidence of tongues and the gifts of the Spirit in the 8th century, the Celtic and Saxony churches. So mention of it there. And then Hildegard of Biggin, is it there? Sang and prayed in unknown languages, some of which is recorded in the lingua Ignota manuscript again from the Catholic Encyclopedia. All right, so that takes us sort of through the first century. Again, this is just a bit of a flyover of, um, of of the history of the church, and we see that there were pockets of people of revival where they were speaking in tongues, and so fulfilling. Where Jesus said, "Look, it's now and few, and that are going to be involved in it." So then we go from the 12th century through the 19th century, and um, we find just uh, again uh, the Waldenese uh, again in France. Um, <clears throat> a lot of these guys had some weird and wonderful ideas. They were basically a Protestant church, and they um, <clears throat> they they were before the Reformation uh, had began, and um, they sort of had some. There were all these ones are recorded to be, you know, to have spoken in tongues as being signed the Holy Ghost and obviously being baptised. Um, but they, they sort of each had their own sort of idea or view on it, apostolic, uh, apostolic sort of um, poverty was the way to perfection is what they believed, you know, and a lot of these things are sort of 
go down as man tries to justify his walk by faith or by works. Anabaptist, uh, very big on baptism uh, with the name, uh, indicates they are sort of around today still too, a bit, um, they, mainly like the four square where they insist upon being baptised in Jesus' name. And I believe if you, if, you, if you haven't had that in your sort of confession of baptism, it's not valid, which is, you know, I disagree with that. But again, it's just one of those things, at least they baptised. And uh, we find again the Huguenots now, um, they are fairly well renowned over, over history for what's, uh, what's been going on um, in the persecution area, particularly, they were a big part of seeing the Reformation come to place because um, I don't know if you recall, there's the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre where uh, it was, the coins were struck and it was recognised and the Catholic Church had this great slaughter on this particular, you know, All Saints Day, St. Bartholomew Day. And it was estimated between five and 30,000 were, were just killed, butchered to death, put to death. And um, <clears throat> that was the worst of the century's massacre, but it was by no means unique to the persecution. But the Huguenots, they were also known for being spirit-filled, the Quakers, uh, you'd be aware of that too, uh, from your understanding. Um, again, you know how clear their vision was and, and, and their, their, their uh, sort of insistence upon it. Um, and we're not sure, but they, they obviously were people who, who, who drew close to God, who, who read their Bible, who sought God after these the, the gifts. And, 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 and as God did, he promised he would send his Holy Ghost, he'd give them power. And so. And that's what gave them this, this, this drive to become the people who they were. So these are the ones that we're connected to by getting filled with the Holy Ghost. Uh, these are the ones that we identify throughout history and time and, uh, and that have been in churches uh, throughout the ages. The Camisards there, also in France, they're more in the South France. They're also very similar to the Huguenots, the same sort of branch there out of Lyon and um, we're probably aware of the Wesleyan revival, as I said, the, all the hymns of the Wesley boys that we still sing today. But uh, uh, there, um, we believe that they also uh, were, had spoken in tongues and uh, you know, gave them that great zeal and power to uh, take the gospel. And obviously, they then spread across to the states. The Evanites were very uh, evangelical too. They really, really desired to know the gifts of the Holy Ghost. They, they saw it there in the scriptures and they, they sought earnestly for it and were filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, began in Scotland, and then they also spread throughout, um, you know, uh, England and uh, then, um, you know, across to uh, the United States. But um, again, uh, they were particularly strong too around in the war years, but they'd probably deviate a little bit from that uh, initial revival. And then the revivals also of the Moody and the Sangster revivals in England and, and America all had all these all these record the, the, the Holy Ghost experience of being, you know, in and amongst them and being in driving part. Okay, um, that sort of takes us up to the 19th century and um, uh, to the start of the 20th century, and which where I really want to just overview our fellowship, uh, where we sort of come from. So, this guy called Charles Fox Parnham, he was born in 1873 and he established the Bethel Bible College in Kansas in the 1900. Now, what was unique about Charles Fox Parnham, apart from having a pretty cool name, um, he realised from the Bible that speaking in tongues was evidenced of receiving the Holy Ghost. That was the evidence. He, he read it, he saw it, and he, he started to to preach it. He said, well, that's how people receive the Holy Ghost. They speak in tongues. Right? And then his first convert there was this lady called Agnes Osmond. And she's believed to be, you know, the first. And you can even check this out on Wikipedia if you want to look up these people who are there and got information on them and just history. She received the Holy Ghost in 1901. And she was the first of that from that 
teaching there over there with the Bethel Bible College and old Agnes comes good speaking in tongues. What and but she expected it because she thought, well, that if it's there, I'm gonna ask for it, and away she went. You know, this dude, William G. Seymour, and um, he attended Parnham's Bethel Bible College in 1905. So established in 1900, 1905, the big fella rocks in and he gets filled with the Holy Spirit. And then he goes across to Los Angeles and he starts the Apostolic Faith Mission at 312 Azusa Street, LA. Now it's still there today, there's a memorial plaque on that particular building in Los Angeles uh, in Azusa Street. And because that's where the beginnings of the Pentecostal churches as believed for our era has started from. So here it is, the Apostolic Faith Mission, 312 Azusa Street, Los Angeles, where he became the pastor, big Seymour boy. So, and that's regarded as the beginnings of our current Pentecostal. So like all things, it all uh, goes from one to another. And, uh, you know, you, the, the Bible talks about the, a faithful witness and that the, the, the word is, is by the foolishness of preaching, the gospel goes out. You know, it's, uh, someone tells someone, this is how you receive the Holy Ghost. Oh, do you really? This is our testimony. You know, Tim was asking the testimonies before. Someone told us. And it's, it, it's, it's this word that goes out that has continued through. And this is the church. And this is where you've ended up, where I've ended up. Now, John G. Lake, he was there, uh, there he received the Holy Ghost at Azusa Street in 1907. And I think it's interesting that, that a black man there is uh, preaching the gospel and he's a white man gone in there. He's received the Holy Ghost. You know, there's so much about, you know, all the racial divides and all the prejudice and all that sort of stuff. But one of the great joys of the Holy Ghost, and if you ever, uh, it just makes us all one. There's, <laughs> there's no such thing as a colour or, a, you know, or a racial you know, discrimination or, you know, or better than each other. This wonderful Holy Ghost makes us all one in Christ. You know? What does it say? By one spirit, we're baptized in the one body, whether we be bond or free, Jews or Greek, you know, it's the one spirit in the one body and the body is Christ, is the church. Okay, he receives the Holy Ghost in, in Azusa Street and then he heads out to South Africa, hits the road. This is the gospel. <laughs> get full of the ghost, what do I do with this? Let's head on out of town. He goes to South Africa and he sets it up in, in there and this guy gets converted called Frederick Van Eyck. All right. And is this how long he lived for? He didn't live real old, 44 or something like that. Van Eyck receives the Holy Ghost at, in Durban at this particular church that he'd come over to establish around 1916. So here we're... Uh, we're getting uh, midway through the war, and um, uh, Van Eyck, he receives the Holy Ghost. And uh, he's probably 20 something, and then he's invited to evangelize in Australia in 1926. So there he's been 10 years spirit filled, and uh, he gets the calling and he says, How about you go to Australia and preach the gospel about getting filled with the Holy Ghost? Right. So he packs his bags. And off he heads, and then he establishes the the Apostolic Faith Mission in Australia and in New Zealand as well in 1927, and that's where the Four Square Gospel comes from in 1929, where it gets established here in Australia. This guy Leo Harris, he uh, his father, his father Cecil, he received the Holy Ghost in that particular group in 1927, so just after they got going. And he became a pastor, Leo Harris. And then Leo, then he also received the Holy Ghost now in 1936. And in 1945, so 11 years later, he's 11 years spirit filled. He, with Thomas Foster, he establishes the National Revival Crusade. All right, 1945. Lloyd Longfield is now deceased in 1919 to 1912. He, uh, he receives the Holy Ghost in 1948, uh, just after the war. He was uh, my original pastor there through, through Melbourne as our senior pastor over the work. And he, uh, you know, tells the story of, uh, you know, being in Egypt uh, in the war and being a messenger and thinking about all the prophecies and, 
and uh, it was just fascinating to see how it all unfolded. Uh, it's big on the, the history of, uh, you know, uh, just how the, the world had come to pass and, uh, and uh, where it all fitted in together. And um, so he ends up at one of these National Revival Crusades meetings and he receives the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues. Amazes him. And then, but he sees that, you know, that, that there's a need to preach this message. And in 1958, 10 years spirit filled, he establishes the revival centers after it gets established. And uh, we are now what part of, we, after we uh, left the, the revival centers, we come now the revival fellowship. Now, um, <clears throat> It's quite interesting then when you, you sort of think about those those particular years and um, I can recall that uh, we went uh, to um, my my first meeting was uh, in Canberra and uh, so here we are starting in Melbourne and uh, it's um, in 1958 there and eventually uh, uh, a few people around them Adelaide and uh, you know that uh, in uh, rural Victoria uh, down Geelong Way, and uh, they start uh, preaching the gospel, and uh, it uh, it uh, goes through to uh, to Canberra uh, there with uh, John Kerwood, uh, his uh, family. He yeah. uh, gets filled with the Holy Ghost, and then they get witnessed to, and then we know that uh, they were uh, there was um, four of them that were in the the military uh, college there at, at Duntree as officers, and they. Uh, Used to meet in the car park in their in their car, and those uh, four men were John Kerwood, uh, uh, Bob Call, uh, his brother Dean Call, and uh, Fred Needham. Um, so uh, they uh, each went and established the works in um, in uh, Canberra, respectively. Uh, they went. To, Bob went to Sydney, started the work in Sydney. Dean went to Wollongong. And Fred went to Auckland, he was a New Zealander, and uh, started the, all the works in those particular areas. We then know that uh, too, from the, the particular time that um, the church started to grow, and uh, as people uh, moved out and came into to the fellowship, that it spread all around Australia. In our own area, we know that, um, well, here in Newcastle, Paul and Linda Scarf, they moved up from Melbourne, and um, we saw that uh, Russell Gay, he, he went up to uh, Toowoomba, Darrell Williams went out to Wagga. Um, it was all uh, there, of course, Smith, uh, sorry, went out to Wagga, yeah, uh, yeah Darrell to Dubbo, and um, Larry Wicks went to the Central Coast there where Greg uh, was uh, testifying earlier on. Hedley Jasky got saved on the Gold Coast, uh, at Nambucca Heads, and uh, eventually went to the Gold Coast. And so men were going out from, from they'll go to the, the meetings, they're hearing about the Lord and uh, just the need, and uh, they were um, going out and, and preaching preaching the gospel. Uh, Neil Jenner went to Cairns, and uh, we had people getting saved over in Perth. And then, so slowly it just uh, started to grow all around Australia, uh, first of all, and uh, and then it went to across the there into the Pacific Islands, uh, Fiji in the early days, and then obviously um, went uh, back uh, Peter Visser moved over to Europe with his family and uh, started to work over there it was work in London again and the UK all from this uh, starting in Melbourne we went went back to Africa there and then uh, you know with Ron Carslake he, he went out there and uh, started to work down there in, in, in um, uh, Cape Town and uh, uh, it, uh, <coughs> Pastor Seves, uh, we had a couple go from New Zealand across to Brazil, uh, and uh, Pam and Michael would know them quite well. I knew them as well, and uh, they started to work over there, which is now grown. We've got works over there. Uh, Mark Lindell up in Canada, and uh, uh, Fresno uh, there, uh, Dave, um, forgot his last name. Anyway, I'm sure we remember them all, as uh, we've seen the work grow throughout and, and continues to do. I guess the jewel in the crown was, was Papua New Guinea too when Godfrey got converted there in Melbourne, got filled with the Holy Ghost, we know his story and and uh, it's, it's been a national revival in that country. Oh, you know, their own television show and <laughs> in all the provinces and uh, just all the signs, wonders and miracles that have taken place and we're really blessed. We know that uh, in 1995, um, again, uh, we found that, uh, again, you know, it's funny that uh, 
that people can, that they start off on this track of getting filled with the Holy Ghost and, and the essence of it, but they can deviate from it. And uh, we found here in Newcastle too, that, that people start to form their own opinions about how it should be. And it causes confusion because we see that we want to stay on this particular path. You know, it's, it's not the broad way, it's, it's a narrow way, it's restricted, it's not, not popular. And uh, again, uh, of course, the split in the church and uh, people, it's the last thing that any church wants. You know, I hate division. I hate it when people uh, saw the, you can see the damage it does. I think that's why the Lord says there are these six things I hate and seven is abomination. The abomination is he that sows discord amongst the brethren. And uh, it, because uh, you can see that good people get uh, get lost, good sheep get uh, get destroyed from it. And, uh, even Lloyd himself came out with some, some silly ideas and we're all saying, that, come on, man, that's not what we were called to. We, this is not what the Bible says. And, uh, oh, no, no, you know, I, it, it becomes opinions rather than scripture. So in 1995, uh, many of us had to make that choice and uh, we decided that we weren't going to agree with this the doctrine of not allowing people who'd, uh, you know, been immoral, that had been spirit filled. Uh, to ever come back to the church. We couldn't find any justification of it. And so we had to start again. And, um, but this time we thought, well, we don't want to have just a, a one man show. We want to make sure that it's, uh, that uh, there is wisdom in the multitude of council. And uh, so in those early days, we formed a church council. And these are some of the original members um, there. Some of them are retired. Uh, uh, Ron uh, down there in the, the uh, right hand corner is, is deceased. Uh, but um, uh, and some are still actively involved uh, in that, and we've also added uh, to that, uh, that 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 number. And there's a lot of safety in that, in the fact there that um, we agree that uh, we uh, we don't change unless we all agree to change. That um, that we've got to be scripturally sure of what we're doing with it, and it's it, and it's, it's been good. It's been been a really a nice uh, sort of stable foundation to uh, for the last uh, 25 years uh, for us as a fellowship to grow in. And the fellowship has grown, you know, you know, rejoice in the Lord, your God, for he's given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, like rain and the latter rain. Great prophecies are about pouring the Holy Ghost. And we're also told that we should be patient, establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord draws near or draws nigh. And I guess that's what we need to sort of take in most uh, for each and every one of us. So you're still all there. Yeah, I'm going to sleep.